So it's Friday, so it's time for poets. Some of us know that as push off early tomorrow's Saturday. But in this context, it's the perioperative enhancement team. Inspired by Dr. Sol Aronson and the team at Duke, a selection of clips to get us thinking about the next steps in providing world-class perioperative care. You'll find the full lectures in our back catalogue, or join us at the upcoming perioperative practicum for expert discussions, business case tips, and hands-on workshops. Go to www.edpom.org and look for our international program of perioperative practicums. Top Med Talk. I'm joined by my co-host Desiree Chapel and Geoff Lacey with special guest Dr. Mike Swart. Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a consultant in anaesthesia, perioperative medicine and intensive care in Torbay Hospital down in Devon. Now, maybe in part it relates to the geography, but your hospital and your area has been well known in our healthcare system in the National Health Service for being very innovative, particularly in the perioperative area. We don't have time to go through the, the whole list and we'll come to one of your national roles in a second, but in particular, evaluation of risk and communication of risk and shared decision making. Well, going back about 20 years ago, uh, my colleague John Garlal, who is a consultant colleague at the moment but was originally a trainee with us, we got into cardiopulmonary exercise testing and we got into that through seeing the work of Paul Holder yep. from Melbourne. And what we thought was going to be a very sort of simple you do a test, you get a measurement, and the man from Del Monte says yes or no mm. to having an operation. We quickly moved to realise that it wasn't about a number, it wasn't actually just about a risk prediction, it was about um, consultations to find out what patients wanted. And, it, and it, has it helped? I can understand, I mean, I know quite a lot about cardiac exercise testing, seen quite a lot of it, I think the patients find it very tangible, because mm. you get on a bike and you're fitter than you expected, or you're as unfit as you thought you were. But let's imagine the patient's very, very unfit now. How do you allow enough time to counsel a patient Mm. to allow them to possibly reach a decision that the surgery that they thought they were going to get is now not in their best interest? Mm. Sounds very time-consuming. Well, first of all, you don't have to end the first consultation with a decision. Right. Um, Also, patients are not just seeing us. They're seeing surgeons. They're being discussed at MDTs. And actually, the most important thing you learn is where decision making is difficult don't do it quickly okay so give it give it time bring people back so i hand over to my colleagues some questions in a second but i I remember one series i don't know if i'm quoting it correctly early on in the days of hearing you talk about it of aortic aneurysm patients who eventually decided not to have their aortic aneurysm repair and the vast majority died with their aneurysm intact Hmm. is that right or is that a bit simplistic? It's probably right, right. but I'm choosing my words carefully yeah, yeah, because yeah. we don't have thorough follow-up. Okay, okay. But, there were, but many of them decided... What, what sort of percentage? So some people are now throwing around numbers like over 65, given the opportunity. Is, is, is it maybe as much as 15 to 20% of patients given the opportunity I not, think not for surgeries? I think aneurysms is a dynamic process because the aneurysms change in size. Yep, okay. The patients uh, change in age. Mm. So patients in the UK with abdominal aortic aneurysms are predominantly male, and they're picked up through two processes. Um, one is the screening, the UK National Screening Programme that scre- offers uh, ultrasound screening to all males age 65. Or they're, they present um, as victims of medical imaging technology, otherwise known as vomits. Right. <laughs> now, a vomit is where you have some other symptoms, say abdominal pain, or, and you end up with a CT scan yeah. that then yeah. finds your aneurysm. Those patients then are seen by vascular surgeons when the aneurysm reaches five and a half centimetres, but actually we see them earlier. Mm. We see them um, before the vascular surgeons. Mm as part of preparation for possible future surgery. So there isn't a, you see somebody and it's yes, no. There's an evolving process, and we may see people over a 10-year period as their aneurysm changes in size, 
and decision making changes. And, and in the MOOC, the Perioperative Medicine Royal College of East UCL mm-hmm. MOOC, uh, I've watched a video mm-hmm. of you mm-hmm. demonstrating uh, a protracted mm-hmm. discussion mm-hmm. process, which re- I found very, very mm-hmm. educating. It mm-hmm. was you, you didn't get off the fence. You mm-hmm. you you gave them options to go away and think yeah. about. Well, well, I think that's a very key bit. Is our job is not to give our own personal opinions. Mm. Our job is to give people information to help them make decisions. Uh, Mike, your description of how you approach the shared decision-making process, particularly with patients in which having an operation might not be in their best interest, um, is one that sounds like involves a lot of time. And I think there'll be a lot of people listening saying, well, I I would like to do that, but I'm not given the opportunity or the facilities to do so. So what is the setup for you and... If it's different from most people, which I imagine it is, how do you go about getting a similar kind of enterprise? I think that's a good question. We do not reflect standard outpatient appointments in the UK. We've developed a clinic where we have one hour for both a consultation and, if appropriate, a cardiopulmonary exercise test. What I would say, though, is we're doing uh, things different to other outpatients we screen who we need to see. So in Torbay Hospital, we do about 10,000 operations a year. Now, we see about 850, 900 patients in that clinic. So we're selecting out the high-risk, either high-risk patients based on age and comorbidities or the surgery. Mm -hmm. So if you design your outpatient service to what you need, you can allocate an hour. And who's filtering that out? Is that the pre-assessment nurses? or it, It's a combination of... Um, we do have some standards for who we should see. Yeah. Uh, that we can get referrals from the pre-assessment nurses. We do get referrals from individual consultant surgeons. And we get referrals from general practitioners. And then you also have the opportunity for... Uh, repeated uh, clinics with patients to see them time and time again as long as needed or what's I wouldn't say we don't set a repeat clinic right. um, they may come back in, uh, or in the guy in the MOOC he came back eight years or six eight years after his original EVAR because there was a complication and in setting up the, 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 the setup you have at the moment did you have um, was there difficulty in that did you yeah. have barriers that um, uh, challenged your yeah. ability to get that up and running yeah. uh, I think we've got the advantage of we've been doing it 20 years mm. so when we started we actually started with seeing elective aortic aneurysm patients in our own time and actually we borrowed the respiratory physicians CPET equipment mm. So we would be seeing people either before their clinic started in the morning or at the end of the day. We then developed with our vascular surgeons a demand and the vascular surgeons valued what we were doing. And then we moved into colorectal, then we moved into orthopedics. So we've we've gradually built in a sort of stealth-like way. Where I would say we can justify ourselves is we have outcome data Um, in a publication that says if you went to our clinic you lived longer and when we were challenged by the medical director who's a gastroenterologist we were able to say can you demonstrate the benefit of your clinic wow that's an amazing way (laughs) the only way to get to buy to get by in there that's great um, it sounds like it's been a real collaborative approach um, over the years and in, in bringing in the different team members. Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit about yeah. who that really involves? I, I think you need to provide a service to the surgeons that they want, and then you need to develop and learn a way of working together. So, for example, we don't at- actually attend all the multidisciplinary team meetings that are around surgical decision-making. But we do have good communication through direct face-to-face contact, phone calls or letter writing to communicate um, our, uh, what, what c- the outputs from our clinic. You also need to actually develop what I would say is a very broad but superficial knowledge of all surgery and all medicine so that you understand... Um, what, what is in there, what the processes or thoughts that are going on within the different surgical specialties. 
Yeah, it sounds like there could be a pretty labor-intensive training for that group, too. I, I think it's. I, I think it's something you learn with time. Yeah. And while some of it could be taught, it's actually about building up relationships with your other colleagues. Nate Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.